morning again. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be bouncing around a lot today in them. I would recommend, though, you uh, put your bookmark in Isaiah 53 and then over in Matthew 27, where we'll be spending the majority of time in those two places and then looking at some other scripture along the way. Uh, As we begin today, can we just go to the Lord in prayer? Father, we come before you this day. As we open your word, humbled by the fact that A, you would give it to us, and B, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear the revelation that you have presented. And so, Father, we thank you for that grace upon grace, and we ask now that you would speak it into our lives. Lord, as I was reminded earlier this week, through the power of that old faithful hymn, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know, thus saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him, o'er and o'er, Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Help us, Lord, to trust you more. In Jesus' name, amen. We began a new series today, uh, talking about, thinking about, looking at the odds and how amazing God is. It's going to be a great journey from now up until Easter and probably even a little bit past Easter as we consider these odds that are Impossible odds, amazing odds, however you want to look at them. We're going to look at at odds a little bit more in a future sermon. But for today, I wanted us just to dive right in. You've probably thought about the odds, haven't you? Uh, Much of our lives are based on the odds. Nobody would get on an airplane, for example, if they thought the odds were against them. Uh, You just wouldn't do it. I flew on a couple of airplanes this week. I was thinking about it sitting there in these packed airports where everybody was shoulder to shoulder waiting in line being herded like cattle into these metal rocket ships that zoom us around the world and um, every plane I was on this week was overbooked Uh, there were so many people flying and I was thinking you know nobody would do this if they thought the odds were they weren't going to get to their destination they considered the odds and said this is safer than driving on I-35 and so uh, I'm going to, to fly an airplane. I think that's part of, part of it, right? So many things in our lives revolve around the odds. They determine and dictate our lives and how we live our lives. Uh, I'll give you another example. I've been to Vegas one time in my life, Las Vegas. Anybody else been to Las Vegas? Okay, I went for a church event. It wasn't a midlife crisis. <laughs> weekend. I don't know what your excuse was, but um, I was there to tell people about Jesus. But while I was there, um, I witnessed people playing in the casinos. And uh, I saw them playing blackjack, of course, slot machines everywhere. I mean, even in the airport, as soon as you get off the airplane, there were people that got off the airplane in front of me and went straight to a slot machine and started playing right there in the airport. It was the craziest thing. I'd ever seen. Saw people uh, playing roulette, the one where they take the little ball and they spin it around and they turn the thing and it lands on a number. I stood for a while at a roulette table and uh, I was thinking for a moment, this is the one I'm going to play. Because there was this guy, he was like a college age guy, pretty young guy, probably in his 20s. And uh, he he was playing roulette and he had done really well. He was up to $80,000. And he was just playing black and red. That's all he was doing, black and red, black and red. And he was like just nailing it. He had $80,000. There was a show fixing to happen in this hotel. Apparently they had tickets to the show. All his friends were around him. It was a lot of energy. Everybody was excited. And he was like, I just want to do one more. I'm putting it all in. Putting it all in. I'm going to go. And, you know, he had been drinking a little. I mean, (laughs) they were having a good time. And he put it all in on black or red, I don't remember which, and lost. Lost it all. And he was devastated for about three seconds and said, Ah, we'll try again tomorrow, you know, and just just went on his way. You know how much money I spent gambling in Vegas when I was there? Zero. You know why? 
I didn't like the odds. Um, I, I watched other people, and I thought, you know, the odds are stacked against me here. Uh, I think I'll just keep this $20 bill in my pocket and put it to work in some other way. The odds can work in, a, in another way too, right? It doesn't just um, necessarily always have to keep us from doing something. It doesn't have to be a negative thing. It can be a positive thing. I'll give you an example. Just this week, Andrew Yen, our lay pastor, um, he sent me a text message. And he asked me to be on the ranch rodeo team for Cowboy Fellowship. And, and I'm going to quote the message that he sent. He wanted me to be the bronc rider, by the way. <laughs> on the team. He said, Pastor Pete, we know you are the world's best bull rider, and thus this would probably translate well into bronc riding too. Would you please join our team so we can please win? And I responded back, because we know the odds, right? I said, Andrew, I can't do it, because it wouldn't be fair to all the other teams. <laughs> I mean, there is a 100% chance that, one, I'm going to ruin that horse. He won't be a bronc after that. And, and, and two, everybody's going to be mad because the preacher took all their money. So, so we, I just, I'm going to have to politely I thank you for the invitation. But um, the odds would be stacked against everybody, and so we don't, we don't want to do that, right? So in, in all seriousness, there are odds all around us, right? And we consider the odds in almost everything we do in one way or another. But have you ever considered the odds surrounding Christ and the kingdom of God? And this is what we're going to be doing over the next couple of weeks. It's going to be interesting and it's going to be fascinating and I think it's going to be practical for your life. To really understand the significance of the odds, we first have to understand how hard it is to predict something. How hard it is to, to prophesy something or how hard it is to make a prediction that actually is going to come true. I'm going to make seven predictions here in a moment. You might want to jot these down just in case they come true. And I'm telling you a few years from now, look, see all seven of those things I said on that Sunday happened, okay? So we'll have it on recording too just in case. But I'm going to make seven predictions. These are just predictions, okay? I'm not saying these are prophecy. I'm just saying these are predictions. All right, someone, prediction number one, someone in our church, from our church family, a member of our church, is going to win a gold buckle at the NFR in 2026, okay? Prediction number one. In 2025, prediction number two, at the ripe old age of 90, Elvis Presley is going to come out of hiding <laughs> and seclusion, and he's going to play a sold-out concert at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. Okay, you writing it down? Prediction number three. Sometime, how many of y'all have ever gotten a text message from Scotty or an email from Scotty? Okay, then you'll get this one. The rest of you may not. Um, and can we give Scotty a round of applause? He's 50 years old. We love Scotty. Celebrating his 50, 50th birthday. Pretty cool. But I, here's prediction number three. Sometime in the next 10 years, our beloved pastor... Scotty Smith is going to become a New York Times best-selling author for an absolutely amazing book. I'm going to name the title of the book as well in this prediction. The title of his New York Times best-selling book is going to be this, The Ins and Outs of Frisbee Golf, How to Become a Champion. Okay? It's going to be great. Be looking for it on store shelves. Okay? Sometime in November of 2029... 2029, November of 2029, a Category 4 hurricane is going to slam into New York City. It's going to be devastating, so be watching for that in 2029. Number five, the Houston Texans are going to win the Super Bowl in 2024. <laughs> it's a prediction. We'll see. Write it down. It could happen. All right? 2032, this is a little further out. Make it a little bit harder. But in 2032, this is my prediction, the Atascosa River will be named the top tourist destination for tubing in Texas. <laughs> 2032, we got some time to work on it. It's going to happen. <clears throat> and number seven, all four of my children are each going to have four children of their own 
All four of them will each have two boys and two girls, perfectly balanced families. And I'm predicting all eight of the boys are going to be just as bald and good looking as their grandpa. <laughs> it's a prediction. Okay? So there, I've just given you just seven predictions. Okay? That's seven. How many of you would be willing to bet on the odds that one of those things would happen? One person, Houston Texans fan probably or something like that. Okay, one, one person. Anybody be willing to bet on the odds two of those things are going to happen? Three, four, five, all seven? Nobody. Nobody's taking those odds, right? Okay, so catch this church. In Isaiah 53 alone, which is where we're going to spend a lot of our time in this series, there are 24 predictions about Jesus, and they all happened. 700 years before he was ever born and ever walked on this planet, these predictions, this prophecy was made, and they all happened. And in the Old Testament, some of which are thousands of years prior to Christ, in the Old Testament, depending on how you count them and which scholar you look at and how you classify prophecy, there's somewhere around 300 prophecies, predictions concerning Jesus Christ, and every single one of them was fulfilled in every way possible. Consider the odds. In Luke 24, 44, Jesus told them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus said that. Now, don't worry, we're not going to look at all 300 of these odds or 300 of these prophecies. Uh, I was thinking about it this week. I was like, man, that'd be a great series to go through all 300 of them. It'd take me like seven years if I, if I preached, you know, through all 300 of them. I mean, it, it would take almost a decade of our time if we do, did that. So we're not going to do that. We're just going to bounce around a little bit. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time in Isaiah 53, but we'll probably go outside of that some in this series as well. Here's our text for today. And I'm going to ask you to do something we don't do often here. <clears throat> I'm going to ask you to read this with me. It'll be on the screen if you've got your Bible. You can read it right there from your chair. We're just going to read this together. I want you to internalize it, feel it, and not, not just hear me read it. So let's, let's try this together as a congregation this morning, starting in verse 12. It says this, Therefore I will give him the many as a portion, and he will receive the mighty as a spoil, because he has willingly submitted to death and was counted among the rebels, yet bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. The big idea for today is this, the thing I want you to remember, Jesus paid the ransom for all rebels. Jesus paid the ransom for all rebels to be set free. All four of the Gospels record the account of Christ's trials and ultimately murder on the cross of Calvary. All four note that he was classified in many ways as a rebel. Today I want to just show you four of those ways. It's all we will have time for. The first is this, Jesus was disapproved as a rebel. He was disapproved. That's point number one. No, no one ever wants to feel like they're disapproved of, do they? I mean, we don't want our parents to disapprove of us. We don't want our children to disapprove of us. We don't want our boss or our employees to disapprove of us. To be disapproved is an awful, awful feeling. If you've ever felt like somebody disapproved of you, you know what that feeling is like, right? If anybody ever does it, even a stranger, even somebody you barely know or don't know at all, if you sense that they disapprove of you, there's something inside of you that says, I don't like that. I want to fix that. I want to remedy that because nobody wants to be disapproved of. Jesus Christ was the sinless Lamb of God and yet he faced the ultimate disapproval and was counted among the rebels of his day. We see it in a very clear way in Matthew 27. Here we find the Son of God and a known rebel named Barabbas. We don't have time to consider today everything there is to consider about Barabbas and his past 
and what a rebel that he was. But let me summarize it by just saying this. He was a known criminal. He was an insurrectionist and he was a murderer. So he wasn't just a rebel. He was the leader of rebels, Barabbas was. And all four of the Gospels talk about the offer that Pilate made to the people. He gave them a choice and a chance to set free one of these two individuals, Barabbas or Jesus Christ. And who did they choose? Barabbas. Matthew put it this way. Matthew 27, 15 through 26. At the festival... The governor's custom was to release to the crowd a prisoner they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, Who is it that you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was because of envy that they had handed him over. While he was sitting on the judge's bench, his wife sent word to him, have nothing to do with that righteous man. She's speaking of Jesus. For today I suffered terribly in a dream because of him. The chief priest and the elders, however, persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas, the rebel, and to execute Jesus, the Christ. The governor asked them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? Barabbas, they answered. Pilate asked them, what should I do with Jesus who's called Christ? They answered, crucify him. Then he said, why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting all the more, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere but that a riot was starting instead, he took some water, washed his hands in front of the crowd and said, I'm innocent of this man's blood See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and our children. Then he released the rebel, Barabbas, to them. And after having Jesus flogged, handed him over to be crucified. This morning we sang Hosanna. Don't you find it ironic, strange, and scary that the same crowd who had shouted and chanted, Hosanna, 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 as Jesus had entered into Jerusalem just days before, are now chanting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him among the rebels. Give us the rebel Barabbas and crucify the Son of God, Jesus. Jesus was disapproved by these people. And he was indeed, just as Isaiah said, counted among the rebels. But ultimately, we know that Jesus paid a ransom there on Calvary. And that ransom was for rebels, even Barabbas. He was not just disapproved of as a rebel. He was also discredited as a rebel. He was discredited. Disapproval wasn't enough for the people on this day. No, they wanted to totally discredit Jesus. They wanted to make sure that everyone knew that Jesus was a rebel and that he would meet the doom of a rebel. So they discredited him again and again and again. And again, we see this in all four of the Gospels, but we will just, for the sake of time, look at Matthew 27 and quickly at John 19. 27, 27. The Gospel of Matthew says, Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus into the governor's residence and gathered the whole company around him. They stripped him and dressed him in a scarlet robe. They twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head and placed a staff in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him. Hail, king of the Jews. Then they spat on him, took the staff and kept hitting him on the head. After they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe put his own clothes on him, and led him away to crucify him. John 19 records it like this. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers also twisted together a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and clothed him in a purple robe. And they kept coming up to him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews! 
and they were slapping his face. They stripped the Savior of the world naked to discredit him. They put a scarlet robe on Jesus to discredit him. They put a crown of thorns in his head, not just to hurt him, but ultimately to discredit him. They came before him and they knelt down to worship him, mocking him to discredit him. They spat on him to discredit him. They repeatedly, over and over and over, hit him over the head with the staff they had put in his hand to discredit him. They slapped him in the face to discredit him. All of this and much, much more was done to show that he's not who he says he is. He's not who he claims to be. It was to signify to the world that this man is no king, he has no power, he is not special, God is not on his side, he is no miracle worker, and therefore he cannot be the Messiah. They were trying to discredit him as the Savior and anoint him as a rebel. 700 years before any of this ever happened, Isaiah said, And was counted among the rebels. And he was. These people who did all of this to Jesus did not have eyes to see or ears to hear. Nor did they have a heart to realize that Jesus was not a rebel. But instead he came to pay the ransom for all rebels. He wasn't just discredited. He was also dishonored. He was dishonored as a rebel. There's no one in the history of the world who deserves more honor than Jesus. Paul tells us in the book of Philippians that God highly exalted Jesus and that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. And they should because there is no other name that deserves honor like his does. Jesus said in John chapter 5, Verse 22, the Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Verse 23, so that all people may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Anyone who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. We're granted a a small but significant picture of the way Christ is honored in heaven in the book of Revelation. And my friends, this is the way it should be on earth as well. It's the way it should have been in Jesus' time. It's the way it should be in our time. Sadly, however, it's not. This is a beautiful picture of how we should be honoring Christ the same way heaven does, with the same passion and the same devotion they do. For Jesus and Jesus alone is worthy of our honor and our praise. I want to invite you, if you will, to just close your eyes for a moment as I read this text. Close your eyes and join me for a brief moment in heaven as we enter into this glorious place and we hear from the Spirit of God concerning the honor that Jesus Christ deserves and the honor that he receives in heaven. Revelation 5, 11 through 14 says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and also of the living creatures and of the elders. Their number was countless thousands plus thousands of thousands. And they said with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slaughtered to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth, on the sea, and everything in them say, Blessing and honor And glory and power be to the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. The four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. I know you probably don't want to leave that place, but if you would, open your eyes and rejoin me here. This is the honor that was due him. 
This is the honor that was due him on this day and is due him on this day. For there is no other name under heaven by which men can be saved. Don't you find it strange and disturbing that we honor kings and queens? That we honor celebrities and athletes? That we honor pastors and priests? That we honor, worst of all, ourselves among all others? But in truth, none of these are worthy of any honor. Only Christ is worthy. But on this day, just as Isaiah said, he was counted among the rebels. He was dishonored as a rebel himself. Return with me to Matthew 27, verse 37. Above his head, they put a charge against him in writing, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. There on the cross, Jesus, the very Lamb of God, hung. And they were treating him like any other criminal. They were making fun of him. They were prodding at him. They were dishonoring the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords with a homemade sign that said, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Yeah, it was Isaiah who said he will be counted among the rebels. And they dishonored him as a rebel. He hung there with two other rebels, one on either side of him. Yes, in a very real way, he was counted among them just as Isaiah said. On this day, there were three accounted for on this hill of suffering, pain, torture, and death. And even the two criminals, the two rebels who hung on his side, mocked him. Matthew 27, 38 through 44. Then the two criminals were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Those who passed by were yelling insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priest with the scribes and elders mocked him and said, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel? Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now, if he takes pleasure in him. For he said, I am the son of God. And then it says in verse 44, In the same way, even the criminals who were crucified with him taunted him this and much more were all about one thing they wanted to dishonor Jesus they wanted him to be counted as nothing more than a rebel on a cross that's why he was treated as a rebel but might I remind you that this all had a purpose you see Jesus had come for a very important purpose he came to pay a ransom For rebels. Let's look at one final way he was counted among the rebels. And that is this. He was dispatched as a rebel. Now when I say the word dispatched, I do not mean he was sent out. I do not mean he was dispatched to go do something. I mean he was killed. He was murdered. He was slaughtered. He was dispatched. My kids raise show rabbits, and when it's time to eat them, mm, I'm getting hungry right now, (laughs) we dispatch them. That's what we call it. They're dispatched. That means they go into the freezer and then into our bellies. Jesus died a rebel's death on the cross. He was dispatched along with two other rebels on this day. You know, the cross was reserved for the most egregious criminals in the Roman world, for rebels. Jaywalking would not get you nailed to a cross. Rolling through a stop sign on accident or on purpose wouldn't get you nailed to a cross. No, this punishment, this death, this way of suffering, it was reserved for the worst of the worst of the worst. 
It's still today considered one of the worst ways to die that man has ever invented. There's nothing glamorous, nothing glorious about the cross. There's nothing easy about the cross. There's nothing fast about this kind of death. So the Romans reserved it for the worst criminals and rebels of their society. And it was here on this cross that Jesus died a rebel's death. He truly was counted among them as a rebel. All four of the Gospels record it. Matthew 27, 50 says, But Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and gave up his spirit. He died. Mark 15, 37, Jesus let out a cry and it says he breathed his last. Luke 23, 46 says, And Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. And saying this, he breathed his last. And John records it this way in John nineteen thirty, When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. Then bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. In John chapter 10, Jesus had even foreshadowed this very moment in history. Here's what he said in verse 11. I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, since he is not the shepherd and doesn't own the sheep, leaves them and runs away when he sees a wolf coming. The wolf then snatches and scatters them. This happens because he is the hired hand and doesn't care about the sheep. I And the good shepherd, I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. I lay down my life for the sheep. And he did. He died there on that cross on that day, a cross that was built for a rebel. But on this day it held the Son of God, the Lamb of God, the Messiah of the world. I don't like it any more than you do, but it had to happen because Jesus came to pay the ransom for all rebels, and this is how it had to be paid. One of the rebels who hung there on the cross next to Jesus ultimately saw that there was something different about Jesus. He recognized that Jesus wasn't a rebel who belonged on a cross. And to that man, Jesus said, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Even one of the soldiers who had tacked him to the cross, mocked him, made fun of him. Perhaps even one of the soldiers who was casting lots for his clothing ultimately realized it after Christ's death. Matthew 27, 54 says, This man said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. He wasn't a rebel. He was counted among them, but that's not who he was. While most thought he was just another rebel, the reality is Jesus was the ransom for rebels. And that includes you. It includes me. It includes everybody you know and everybody you don't know. Because you are a rebel. And that cross was yours and mine. The Bible says all have sinned and fallen short in Romans 3.23. It says we are all rebels in the eyes of God. The book of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 says, And you, you were dead in your trespasses and sins because you're a rebel. To the Romans and to you, the Apostle Paul wrote in chapter 3, verses 9 through 12, What then? Question mark. Are we any better off? Not at all. For we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God, All have turned away. All alike have become worthless. There is no one who does what is good. Not even one. Because we're all rebels. 
There are many rebels, but there is only one who came to pay the ransom for the rebels. And his name is Jesus. He hung on your cross and mine. He paid the price for your sins and mine and for the rest of the world. He was counted among the rebels so you can be counted among the saints. What did Isaiah say? He was counted among the rebels, yet he bore the sin of many and interceded for the rebels. He interceded for you on that cross that day. What are the odds a man would do that for you or me? God is so good. Let's pray. If you're here today and you are still counted among the rebels and not counted as a member of God's family or among the saints, I would remind you one final time that he paid the ransom for your rebellion and your sin. He hung on that cross so you could be set free and forgiven. And so today we're not going to ask you to walk an aisle. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or raise a hand. I'm just going to ask you to pray to the God of heaven who sent his one and only begotten son to die for you. Pray a prayer of repentance, a prayer of faith, and a prayer of hope. The Bible says if you will believe and confess, you will be saved. And you will no longer be counted among the rebels, but among the saints. Your name being written in the Lamb's book of life now and forever. you take hold of what Jesus did for you on the cross that day if that's you just pray with me even if you're online this morning you pray with me say Lord it's me I confess that I'm a sinner I know that I've messed things up and gone astray so I ask now by faith that you would change me from the inside out Lord I ask that you would make me new make me whole By faith, I ask that you would forgive me of my sins and give me the great gift of eternal life. I thank you for dying a rebel's death for me. Thank you for forgiving me and loving me and coming for me. Father, as we close this morning, we are in awe, not of the odds, but of the one to whom none of the odds matter. Because you are the God of the universe, and in your infinite provision for our lives, sent your son Jesus to die as a rebel, to suffer as a rebel, to be dishonored and disfigured, discredited, to ultimately die and be dispatched as a rebel so that none of that would happen to us. Thank you for adopting us into your family, for making us your children through the work of that cross. Lord, I pray for these who've gathered here to worship you and just ask that you would bless them and those they love. Help them to live as faithful saints to you and your word. Help them to trust in Jesus and oh, to trust him even more. Lord, I know that some of them feel like all the odds are stacked against them right now in life. Oh, I pray that they would trust in Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you. We ask and we pray these things now in Jesus' name.